Good afternoon. I'm PK. It's my son Riley. It's kind of like the Riley and PK show on Monday afternoon since there's nothing really else to do. Uh, we're here at Riley's house. Uh, we've shut our practice down as I know many of you have shut your practices down and we feel your pain, uh, but we're going to get through this all together and I think uh, it, it's, it's going to be okay. It's just going to be a, one of those things we just get through. Uh, I go by PK. Many of you uh, have signed on, haven't met me before. Uh, that's just initials for Paul Kenneth. I'm a, I'm a junior to my dad. I have a son that's uh, uh, Paul Kenneth and a grandson that's Paul Kenneth. Um, I have five sons, one daughter, a bunch of grandkids. But uh, besides family, the only thing I really know in life is uh, dentistry. So uh, Riley and I are going to share with you some things that we think are really important today. Uh, to begin with, by way of introduction, I uh, founded uh, White Cap Institute many years ago, had the privilege of teaching about 2,500 doctors over about 14 years uh, period of time. It brings me great satisfaction, a great uh, personal joy, if you will, to help doctors help their patients. I'm a huge patient advocate. And today we're going to talk about something I think that will affect your patients more than anything that we do in dental implantology, and that is the way we treat the bone. So our topic today is slow your drilling down, a thoughtful protocol for surgical exactness. And we're in a different world today. We're not just looking to put the implant in bone in the shell of a crown. We're looking to exactly place it where it needs to be for a custom abutment to be placed the day of, moment of surgery, and a temporary on top of that most of the time. We live in a great time. Uh, I joined uh, and partnered with Dio. Dio uh, Navi is a company that some of you haven't heard about. It's kind of a funny uh, pronunciation. Dio is just D-O, Dio, but it's spelled D-I-O. So just drop the I and it's Dio Navi. Dio is the implant company we've partnered with for the reasons you'll see. And the Navi is navigation. It's all A to Z navigationally driven for outcomes that I've never seen in 31 years of doing implants. Glad you've joined us. Uh, this should be, this should be a, a well-spent use of your hour. Okay, well, appreciate you coming in. I think we still probably have a few more coming in, but we're gonna get started. We have planned about 50 minutes of lecture and then we'll do some question and answers at the end. So there is an area um, Q and A. If you click there, you can type in any questions and we'll try to answer as many of those as we have time for at the end of that. Otherwise, hopefully all this stuff is working well for you. Sound is on and uh, you should be hearing us. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanted to share a little bit of what our objectives are um, before we can talk really about drilling, we have to talk a little bit about what we're drilling on, and that's the hard tissue, the bone. So we're going to review just a little bit simple bone anatomy, um, not dental school uh, level, just some real simple review of, of bone. We want to identify what our treatment goals are when we're actually forming our osteotomy. I think it's an important exercise to really discuss what are we trying to accomplish? What is the purpose of, during our osteotomy preparation? Um, lastly, then we're going to get into the meat of the topic, which is we want to introduce a drilling protocol of how we manage this anatomy of the bone and how do we do it in a way reaching our goals um, for an ideal osteotomy preparation. And then we'll show a clinical case or two, answer some questions. Over the years, I've used about a dozen different implant systems. They all come with different burrs. They all come with different uh, protocols for drilling, different speeds. Today, we're going to introduce some things that are radical they're revolutionary and they're going to change your practice. They're gonna change how you feel about your surgery outcomes. And most importantly, they're going to give your patient the best long-term outcomes possible because there's nothing like this that I've ever seen. Uh, in 31 years of doing implants, we have a new revolution going on, uh, slow drilling, no water, and burrs that were designed to cut just uh, a little differently than any other burr on the market today. Okay, so real quick, I think it's important just to remind ourselves, sometimes um, implants are so mechanical, maybe we think of them as kind of a static object, one that's not alive or one that's homogenous, 
Bone obviously is twofold. We have an outer shell that is the cortical bone. It is extremely dense, extremely strong, but those are good things, but it has a bad property and that is that it's avascular. And so because it's avascular, it has to steal its blood supply from the periosteum on the outside and the trabeculated bone on the inside. Because that tissue, the cortical bone is avascular, it's very prone um, to die back during times of stress or trauma. And so I think it's important that we realize that we're drilling in a tissue that is avascular, that steals its blood supply from other tissues. Um, we love the cortical bone because of its strength, although sometimes we struggle with it because of its um, tendency to die back on us and have bone loss because of that lack of blood supply. And Riley, I think you hit it right on the head. I think that we have to think about this bone we're drilling as two distinct uh, bones and treat it deliberately differently. And if you think of it as one homogenous piece of bone or, or like in the literature, a piece of wood, oh boy, you're, you're already in trouble because we're not thinking right. So cancellous bone in the middle, sometimes called trabeculated bone, that's a loose pack, weak, it is vascular. We are gonna treat these bones differently. You're gonna see in the drilling protocol how we make accommodations during surgery um, for the different um, um, properties, if you will, of these different bone types. So just a quick review there, make sure we're on the same page with that. I would also point out that lamina dura, the bone that uh, our periodontal ligament fibers uh, hold our teeth in, is also corticated bone. And by being corticated bone, it isn't a vascular bone. And as we get into implantology a little bit more, one needs to appreciate lamina dura does not have its own blood supply. It gets its blood supply from the one half from PDL and the other half from uh, trabecular bone. And then just to review, corticated gets its blood supply from the top, as Riley said, periosteum from the top side, and then from the trabecular bone to the lower portion of the cortical bone. So also with bone anatomy, we'd want to just review, again, this is just showing you that the implant is going to reside in two different types of bone. We need to prepare an osteotomy with both bone types in mind. Really quick, you guys probably know this, but also to keep in mind is there's going to be different ratios or proportions of cortical bone and trabeculated bone. So this is Mish's analysis with D1 through D4 categories, D1 being mainly found in the anterior mandible. And that's basically a big block of cortical bone, very little, if any, trabecular bone. This is a very, very prone area for overheating. We have to be careful when we drill here, here because there is no blood supply inside. It is all very dense. And because of that, we have to be very, very thoughtful. So that's D1 bone right there. D2 bone, you're seeing a little bit more trabecular pattern inside. You're seeing the cortical um, shell on the outside, still a great bone for stability of the implant. If I could pick, I think, one bone to be in at all times, it would be D2 type bone. We have good strength from the cortical area, and then we have a lot of forgiveness because of the blood supply inside the trabeculated area. This is typically found in posterior mandible. Um, obviously, I'm going to show you some x-rays in a little bit. You can see this bone anywhere, but categorically, that's typically where we see it. Here we have D3 bone, typically found um, in the anterior, the mandible, um, and uh, sorry, not the mandible, the maxilla. And then implant stability is often a problem here when we get in D3, just because of the lack of cortical bone. Um, so that's D3 bone. And then D4, we don't see it tons when we do it in posterior maxilla. Basically no cortication, a lot of trabeculation, and that trabeculation is very loose as well. Um, this is an area we have to be very, very thoughtful with. So just a little bit of bone anatomy there to make sure we're on the same page. Bone is not created equal. There's two different types, cortical and trabecular, and then there's four categories based on the ratio of those bones. Okay? Now, I don't want to suggest that that bone is always in one location. D1 is not always in the chin area. D1 can be even in the pre-maxilla at times. Uh, D, D2 uh, can be here as well as in the posterior mandible. But it is uh, probably smart to think about bone in maybe three ways. It's hard, it's medium, and it's soft. So as you approach a soft, medium, or hard, or if you prefer a D1 through D4, 
but I don't, I don't uh, make a big announcement in the surgery. Hey, I'm in D4 bone. I'm in soft bone. And we deal with soft bone differently than we deal with hard bone. And I think it's very important to, to realize these bone differences have uh, different locations. But I've had cases where that are severely atrophic and you'll have D1 bone in the upper uh, maxilla because the cortical plate of the buckle welded together with the cortical plate of the uh, palate and you had no trabecular bone. But it's important when you do implants to identify the bone, try to make some decisions. Is it hard, is it medium, or is it soft? And there's drilling protocols for each of those uh, density uh, category, categories. All right, I found some screaming kids and I put them back in their room so we can continue. So um, here you're seeing pretty much homogenous. This is not typically what you see. I just wanted to show a few x-rays that kind of add some real perspective on what's, um, what's what. In your CT analysis, you'll be able to review the bone and come up with a, a game plan for your surgical protocol. But here, this looks very much like anterior mandible, but this is posterior mandible. Right here, that is very, very dense. That's anterior maxilla. That is not what you would expect that to look like. Um, so you just have to be thoughtful. Although we give categories of where it is, it can be found anywhere. Um, so just be thoughtful with that. I think we have one more. There's posterior mandible, very, very low density. To make it even easier for you, the DO Navi uh, software has categorized circumferentially around your dental implant being planned, the D1, D2, D3, D4 complexion. And it gives you an assumption whether you can load it or not load it. I'm, I'm very appreciative of that uh, software sophistication and the ability for it to predict what my outcome is going to be like before I even start my surgeries based upon a Hounsfield uh, density rating, which defines itself to a D1 through D4. Okay, we kind of set the groundwork, bone, bone density, bone anatomy, um, probably a review for most of us, but we just want to make sure we're all on the same page moving forward. We want to talk now about the goals of our osteotomy preparation. I don't know if any of you have ever sat down and said, what am I trying to accomplish? Um, but I think it's an important exercise so that you make sure you have real purpose behind um, the procedure of our osteotomy preparation. As we have done that exercise, this is what we have come up with. So number one, we want to be atraumatic to bone. We cannot overheat it. We cannot overstress it. Again, because implantology is so mechanical, it's very easy to want to maybe tighten things tighter than they should be without being respectful of the biologic principles. So atraumatic is really big. Part of that process, we don't want to overheat the bone. If we hit 47 degrees Celsius for just a second, that's going to cause tissue necrosis. We'll have dieback. I think you've probably been there. I have been there, been guilty of that before. Um, you have to be very, very careful with heat. And we're going to talk about some really unique protocols with the DO system. Um, ideal sizing and shaping for initial torque. Obviously, our goal is initial stability of the implant. We measure that in Newton centimeters. Our hope is to be around 35. How we open, how we shape the osteotomy will determine if we reach that goal or not. One of the other goals of the osteotomy prep is to make sure that we're LAD appropriate. This is a white cap uh, acronym. I made it up years ago just to help uh, communicate to doctors the importance of three things when you're placing a dental implant in bone. It's location, it's angulation, and it's depth. And we could spend a day talking about just LAD alone. Thank goodness, uh, LAD principles of freehand are also applicable in, uh, in guided surgery. So one of our big goals is to make sure the location's ideal, the angulation is appropriate to the opposing arch, and the depth of the, the crest of the, of the implant, the apical end, and the coronal end are appropriately uh, placed in bone according to depth. And then, of course, it's kind of fun to, to realize when you have a different strategy of drilling that is uh, slower, that you can harvest some bone off your drills and use that bone morphogenic proteins to put into the future mix for some of your uh, bone grafting on that same patient. So these are our goals of the osteotomy prep. All of these add up to just simply one thing. We want everything we do to have a 
an element of exactness. That's a word that I've made up. The exactness describes exactly what I'm trying to do with my implant uh, placement. I want it exactly in the right place, done in the right way, so that the outcome is as long and as favorable as po humanly possible. And this system has all of that going for it. So let's jump into the protocol a little bit. We'll spend the majority of the time talking about this. Um, what you're essentially seeing right here is the drilling protocol for a four, five by 10. Now, how do I know that? If you look in the lower left, it shows this size there, four, five by 10. Something I like about DO is they have made a little picture like this for every size implant. So when I order a surgical guide, I get a piece of paper that looks like one of these. And depending on the implant size, it will have a paper and it's a wonderful picture showing me exactly what the surgical protocol is going to look like. Um, going back to this one, basically it's broken down into a couple of phases. Um, the first two drills, tissue punch and bone flattening, we're going to dive into each one of these. I just want to categorically break this down for you. So that is preparing the soft tissue and bone for drilling. Then we have a 2-0 drill um, denoted here in the gray. And then from 2-0 to 7. And then obviously it will follow different diameters and lengths based on the diameter and length of your implant. But the initial drilling here, and then from there widening the osteotomy while also going deeper, um, that's essentially the protocol down below. There's some jump out, um, kind of like a freeway. There's an exit for D3. This is where you stop if the bone is D3. And again, like my dad said, in the software through a Hounsfield unit, it will tell you, is this D3, D2, or D1? You obviously, as the clinician, can make the determination from tactile feedback. However, we do have computer analysis available so you know exactly what density that bone is going to be in. Um, really, really thoughtful, though. I tape these up in the surgical room and I'm staring at these up on the top right, I write in what number um, the implant is. Um, and then from there, I reference to this as I'm drilling just to make sure I get that exactness in my, my protocol. So I love these little sheets here. Like I said, they have a lot of different sizes to them. At the very bottom, notice slow drilling. So the drill speed is 100 RPMs. I would say it's a range, maybe 50 to 100, but you're not going more than 100. So and you're not using water. This is, this is a revelation. You're not using water because with guided surgery, the water is not going anywhere anyway. So don't kid yourself. So basically by, by using a drill that was designed for end cutting without water and fabricated in Switzerland for its greatest ability to cut bone atraumatically, we have a real winning system here. And so end cutting strategy coupled with eventual profile cutting is a, is a very nice way to go. Let's show you how it works. So we're gonna go through each one of these phases here. Number one, tissue punch. So on the left, what you're looking at is the very <clears throat> thoughtful DO tissue punch. It's a double layered blade system is what they call it. So it has the perimeter blade that actually incises the tissue down to the bone. But then internally, there's a secondary blade that goes around scraping the top of the bone, actually pulling the tissue off the bone and it um, will reside in the, uh, the tissue punch itself. When I first did this, I didn't believe it. They said, this is a great tissue punch. I said, I've never met a tissue punch I liked because basically it excises the tissue. Then I have to take the old system and uh, take the guide off and use a soft tissue curette to pop out the tissue. Those, that of you, those of you who are smiling right now know exactly what I'm talking about. This system is unique. It carves out the tissue then the tissue resides here in this uh, tissue punch. We found we just use a white or green suction and suction it out so it's not hard for the ladies to do the sterilization and the cleanup later. But a great tissue punch, uh, very thoughtful, and it works the way it should. Yeah, where this was really frustrating with the conventional ones on the right side of your screen is if we ever fixated a guide with horizontal anchor screws, it would be tough. We would fixate it then we would tissue punch it and then we'd have to take it off, use the tissue curette to get the tissue off and then fixate it again. In that process, sometimes the fixation screws lose their retention. Um, and if nothing else, it's just really annoying for the workflow. So I love the thoughtfulness, even something as simple as the tissue punch in this protocol has been redesigned 
um, to be so much more user friendly. So Riley, talk about what makes this speed is sometimes variable for me. Uh, tell me what you do to optimize it. Yeah. And then I'll share with what I do if, if you don't give me the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> Very good. So, I mean, this instrument, I still use at 100 RPMs. There is a little bit of wiggle room built into this where you can actually roll it around a little bit. And by rolling it around, it helps. If for some reason I feel like at that slow 100 RPM speed, I'm not able to get down, I will go up maybe to 300 RPMs. Anytime I go above 100 though, I do have some external irrigation from my assistant via monojet um, being applied. But for me, the 100 works almost all the time. A little bit more speed can help, but it's the rolling that I find makes a big difference. And don't you think the pressure that you have to exert is a little bit more than you would really think about uh, unless you've done a lot of these. You've got to push fairly sure. hard, but if you do, so he answered the question beautifully. Uh, what we want to do is, is recognize sometimes it might say 100, but this I think sometimes runs better at 300. And if you exceed 100, then obviously supplement with some saline uh, to cool everything. Yeah, to your point, because it's a tissue punch, we think soft tissue. We think, oh, minimal pressure. We're not cutting bone. I argue that the purpose of the tissue punch is actually to plane and to cut into the bone. So you need to think of it that way. The word tissue punch makes you think it's a little bit more of a gentle instrument than it actually is. You do need to be cutting all the way down to bone. And so you're pushing quite hard, um, just like you would with your, your bone yeah, drills. You're, you're really trying to cut the cortical plate just a little bit. And in the process, you get a clean excision of that tissue through this dual blade uh, uh, invention they've got. Yeah, if you're not getting the tissue sucked up into that instrument, you're not pushing <clears throat> hard enough, simple as that. And if you're not pushing hard enough, it might be that you're just a dental wuss and you just have to man up. <laughs> Very true. Just kidding. We can we really. diagnose you with that. That is one step of diagnosis. <laughs> So from here is the bone flattening drill. I will tell you, this is probably the most important drill in the whole process. And I've come to really appreciate this drill. I used to look at that process of drills and I used to just think in my mind, which of those can I cut out because I wanna make it faster, um, saving a whole 10 seconds. I've learned though that this bone flattening drill does a very important thing by creating a flat tabletop surface before using your end cutting drills you do not introduce any angle or cant to that initial drilling. And I've had some guide systems where I do not have a bone flattening drill and every drill seems to be fighting the natural trajectory of the surgical guide. And I think what happened was the drill started on a plane, started to deviate a little, and there's this constant battle between where the bone wanted to push the drill and where the guide was trying to guide it. And even worse, then the, the drill flexes and it becomes aberrant to the exactness that we're trying to get. Now, I would say too, with this, with this drill, you're, you're using it at 150 to 100 RPMs, no water. You're only bearing down up to maybe five to 10 seconds, maybe you know less than 10 seconds for sure. Then you wanna come out, your dental assistant gets in, irrigates, removes any bone chips, cools the system down, gives you a chance to get rid of the autogenous bone on the end of this burr by, by dipping it in some saline and just removing it. Then you can go back if you haven't gotten to the setback requirements of your instructions. So this dark uh, line here or the top of it or the base of this one indicates a setback. And we'll talk about that shortly, but you have to hit minimum setbacks in order for this to do what it was intended to do. But again, without water, no more than 10 second push and uh, come out when you're exceeded that, let the bone rest, let your dental assistant get in there and do, do their job. Again, this is one of those instruments that helps set apart the workflow that we're talking about right now in terms of the exactness. There's no question putting a guide on and drilling even on a slope is more accurate than trying to do it freehand, in my hands at least. However, to make it the next level of accuracy, bringing this bone flattening drill in makes a huge, huge difference so that we start. And you see the x-ray there. I think that x-ray, I mean, that tells the whole story. Trying to drill straight on that slope of the first x-ray would be much more difficult than the second. And many times we've already planned to be subcrestally placed because of the topography of this uh, crest of the bone. So by using this bone flattening burr the way it was recommended, 
we can, we can make a, a great impact on the subsequent exactness of the other burrs. So this is a burr that we've come to hugely appreciate. It's made a big difference in our accuracy, and uh, I think you'll find it uh, the same for you. Okay, so now we're getting to um, a really important distinction here with the DO system. So as some of you probably know that are doing guided surgery, there's essentially two main camps, if you will, out there. Drilling where the drill and a key is used, like on the left, a key or tube is placed into the surgical guide and then parallel drills go into that. The second on the picture on the right is a tubeless or a keyless drill, which is where the drill and the key are basically one piece. Ergonomically, the one on the right seems to be very popular. Clinically, I find that it lacks some good clinical results that we're seeing. And so what DIO has done is created kind of a hybrid system, if you will, where the initial drills, meaning the 2.0 pilot drills, are the only drills that use a tube or key. The reason for that is it is a much more accurate methodology. After creating a pilot 2.0 hole, they then switch to a keyless system. So I'm excited to share with you some differences about this and why this is so important. This next picture, I think, tells really the whole story. So in blue, so this is again on the left, what the key system looks like. The key inserts into the guide, and then you have this giant surface area. In this case, it can be 8 to 12 millimeters in the DO system that is helping guide the drill. If you compare that to the right, there is no key, and the drill, as it begins to touch the bone, is just barely being uprighted or guided, if you will, only maybe two millimeters worth, and it creates and allows for rocking. And any of you that has used a keyless-only system, you're very familiar with this problem. So on the left, you have more contact. More contact equals a straighter path. That straighter path means a more accurate osteotomy. On the right, you're going to create that friction in the guide where they're kind of fighting each other because you never started actually flush with the guide itself. And interesting enough, with this DO system to gain the exactness necessary for immediate placement of temporaries and abutments, abutments and temporaries, we're only, we're only going into the bone two, three millimeters at the most per burr. And this allows for uh, some en enormous uh, accuracy versus taking a great big long burr going through a tube or a key system and going to its true working length. That still has issues. So it's not just the key. The key is helpful, but the short, methodic cuts with additional burrs makes a huge difference. And then the patient doesn't have to open up so wide because you're already drilling down into the bone. And another, another uh, procedural thing that I need to mention is you don't run these burrs until you're down on the bone. Don't run them to get them lined up. Get them lined up perfectly without running them. Mitigate all of that uh, heat and then go ahead and, and start your 10 second rule to bear down on the bone. So let's talk about these two <clears throat> concepts, though, the key and the tube for a second. So when you look at these two, the precision fit of a tube and a key is much more accurate, not even a degree of divergence possible, almost three degrees on a tube type fit. Now, we're getting into some different math here. This might make your eyes uh, roll back a little. But if you do some math here, and if you had two degrees, three degrees, let's say, of wiggle room, and you're placing a 10 millimeter implant, you could be off a whole millimeter at the apex. That's denoted here on the right. You know, when you talk about 19 times tangential 3%, I start to go into anaphylactic shock. The only thing I want to have to do with tan is, is that on my motorboat. Yes, this but, is a different anyway, type of tan. Sorry guys, this is really, really disturbing. This slide showed up. Shame so, on you, Riley. I know, but here's the deal. 19 millimeters, some of you might be saying, I don't place 19 millimeter implants. Well, we're talking about the total length of the drill. If your drill says nine millimeters, my guess is when you actually measure it all, you're somewhere between 17 and 20 millimeter actual length to accommodate for the height of the actual surgical guide. So when it says 19, that would be just a 10 millimeter implant. Down below, you see a 23.5. That would be a 13 and a half millimeter implant. If you were off five degrees, 
the apex would be two millimeters in a different position. So if any of you have been doing guided surgery and you've always wondered if this little wiggle room actually matters, and then you take a post-op CT and you think, I think it does matter, here's the math proving to you that it does matter. Um, this is a really big deal. Exactness is not plus or minus one or two millimeters. We're asking for something better than that and something more than that. So although the ergonomics of a Kela system are nice, the numbers tell us that it's actually not as accurate as we might um, want. So looking at the tube concept again, this is a very tight fit. So the tube fits into the sleeve with 0 0.01 millimeter space. And then the drill fits into the tube 0 0.1 millimeter space. So if you add up all the different degree difference, you're still less than one degree total ability to be off track. That's really, really impressive. That's why, like my dad said, we can make custom abutments, um, print um, PMMA crowns and have them fit without proximal contact adjustment is because these implants are simply landing where we planned them exactly. Not perfectly, um, but much more exact than anything we've been able to find with other systems out there. So that is the initial drill. So again, we tissue punched, we bone flattened, we put this tube in, we will initial drill to get that initial accuracy because that is so important for the rest of our drilling. After we create that initial um, osteotomy with the 2.0, we then do go, um, skipping ahead, to the keyless type drills. We're gonna talk about those just a second. Let me show you a few pictures of the irrigation system. So we mentioned this already. It is 100 RPM drilling, no water. The water is done in between. So the workflow is this. The doctor gets the drill. They drill down. They have 10 seconds to push. I prefer seven, but the math, I'll show you a chart in just a second. You have 10 seconds before you overheat the bone. It's not a pumping action like in freehand. It is push the drill to the bone. Once you're on the bone, push the pedal, and you have 10 seconds to push. After you come out, the assistant goes in with this needle tip and they irrigate down at the base of the osteotomy. On the end of that is hooked probably a 20 to 50 cc syringe. We use normal saline. Um, you could use a smaller cc syringe. You're just going to find that you're reloading it more and more. So that is how we're irrigating. These charts are fascinating. On the top right, this is some research that was done. Uh, 1,000 RPMs or more in less than three seconds, you're already above 55 degrees Celsius. You've nuked the bone. Your implant has failed before you even got to your taper drills. That would be a problem. Now, down here at the left, if you're drilling less than 100 RPMs, now, obviously, there's a few variables. How hard are you pushing? How dense is the bone? Those are very hard things to calculate. But the point here is slow drilling, you have up to 12 seconds before the bone actually gets above 40 degrees Celsius. I prefer seven seconds to make up for some of those variables of how dense the bone is, how hard you might be pushing. But the reality is slow drilling with irrigation in between is gonna keep the temperature of the bone low. And really seven seconds is still a long time. You could even do four to five, six seconds. But the point is it's a total different concept. You're not pushing and releasing, pushing and releasing. You're, you're going down without starting the burr then get it rotating, and then don't exceed a, a period of five, six, seven seconds, you're going to be fine. So the science is saying this, my clinical outcomes are telling me this, the patient's outcomes are telling me this, sometimes fast spinning burrs that are beat up, you don't know how sharp they are, can be a little bit deceiving to the well-being of what's really being done. The other thing nice about slow drilling <clears throat> is that drill, as it moves slowly, it is able to stay on its trajectory a lot better. Um, the analogy that I like to use is like a race car on the highway. If you got a race car, you're going 150 miles an hour, and you move your steering wheel just a little bit because of a bump in the road, it might be game over for you because of all of that force and momentum pushing forward. Um, with a drill, as you're drilling 1,000, 1,500 RPMs, that centripetal force, as it hits a soft spot or a hard spot, can cause it to deflect or bend into different areas. With a slow speed and less centripetal force, you're able to stay on your true trajectory following the path of the guide. I think there's a lot of benefits to it, the safety of it, 
um, simply just the ease of it and just the simplicity of that the procedure is perceived by the patient might be an advantage. That slow drilling is very, very benign for the patient in terms of the psycho psych psychology of it. And then Riley, I think what's also great is you're taking that irrigation tip after just drilling maybe three millimeters deeper and getting down in there in a period of, of, of quiescence. You're not drilling, it's protecting yourself. Your dental assistant's doing that. Uh, the deeper you get into bone, the more propensity there is for bone heat. And so by this system, we're mitigating that heat accumulation and the outcomes are, are more uh, kind to the bone. So again, that's this little side note on irrigation. Getting back into the protocol, after we go down with our initial drill um, with the key, we then switch over to the keyless or tubeless drills. Now these follow a stepwise pattern. So notice the picture on the right. We will go down five millimeters, then 8.5, and then 10. Now, if you're thinking what I first thought, I'm clever, I'm pretty smart. I'm gonna skip the five and the eight five and just do the 10. Because I thought that would get me the same clinical result. I have been very surprised to find out that does not produce the same result. That longer drill treading its path all the way down creates some actual movement because we don't have this principle called double contact drilling. This is very, very thoughtful that DO has. So by going down five millimeters, your next drill, eight five, will be guided by the initial five millimeter osteotomy. It's kind of hard to explain, so I put these little yellow bars on here. So if you could imagine the five drill is being guided by the two millimeter hole in the bone already, and by the sleeve at the top. The 8.5 drill is being guided five millimeters worth in the actual bone, and then also the four or five millimeters of the actual sleeve. So you're getting almost 10 millimeters of true guidance into the bone as you get further in your length. And then the same is true for the 8.5 relative to the 10. In addition to that, none of these burrs are asked to go any further apical than a predecessor. See, the predecessor, the 2.0, went to the 10. So we're not asking it to uh, discover new boundaries. We're just asking it to circumferentially, judiciously gobble up 7 tenths of one millimeter at the 10 length, utilizing the double contact. The 5 to the 8.5 is a double contact. Then the 8.5 to the 10 is a double contact. And you have to really think that through, but that is the reason we're getting the exactness that we're getting is because of this double contact with the sleeve burr in sequential uh, methodical order end cutting slow speed no more than 10 without water it's it's really quite cool now this is a counterintuitive thought for some of the systems out there a lot of the systems are turning into this drill with like one and a half burrs and put in any implant and I think that looks really clever if you're trying to make a new, you know, land speed record for implant placement. But also you forgot, also follow the yellow brick road. Yes. That, 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 that seems to be the mantra out there. Fewer burrs, follow the yellow brick road and get it done fast, cheap, and easy. And that's what you're going to get. What we're finding here by taking the extra, I mean, this is literally another 30 seconds of work. But by taking the additional 30 seconds, we're getting that extreme accuracy. Um, and again, end of the day, aren't we using a guide to get the implant where we want it? Um, why not embrace a protocol that is different, but it is getting different, I would argue, better results than the competition out there. Um, it's, it's really exciting to see, but it is counterintuitive. I know some of you are probably listening, thinking, well, that's more drills. The industry is going in the opposite direction, less drills. And I'd say, yes, they are, but are you getting the results that we're getting? Um, and I would, I would argue that, that probably not. And why would we sell you more drills? Uh, they cost us more money. The fact is, it's just the end of the game. We get a better outcome. You said something about our competition. There is no competition for this because there's nobody that is doing an A to Z solution. The competition is simply using a guide to put an implant in to fit in an eventual shell of a crown. That's, that's the competition. So we're, we're upping the game. So we're looking at, at getting an implant, custom abutment and a temporary placed in the same moment. And that's what our goal is for each of you and ourselves. So that is the tubeless drilling. Um, we're gonna review all these in just a second, but I want to now highlight the profile drill. 
after we use the parallel drills that you just saw, we will put a taper or profile into the bone. So if you look at the pictures on the right, you'll see that on the top, no profile is used there. The threads are outside the shell of the straight osteotomy we prepared and in very low density areas of bone, that might be ideal. You might even undersize it more than that picture represents. However, to the point that we first talked about, about cortical bone, we have to be very thoughtful about overstressing the cortical bone area. And so a profile drill predominantly tapers and shapes the top half to third of the osteotomy to protect about overstress in the cortical region. So that's the profile drill you're seeing there. There are instructions when to use the D, um, when to use the profile drill at different depths. You see the black line there. The black line, you can either drill to the top of it or the bottom of it based on the density. And so if you feel like it's a little softer, maybe you drill to the more apical end. If it's a little bit um, stronger, we'll drill all the way up to the top. That is the um, prerogative of the, of the clinician. So that is the profile drill. Not a lot to talk with that. I think um, it's pretty intuitive what it does. Um, this is a really neat drill right here. Because Dio puts a lot of emphasis on immediate load, um, they have answered kind of the problem of how do we get abutments to not run into different bone. As we know, bone is not perfectly flat, especially when you're up against teeth and abutments will often um, interfere with them. So they have this abutment profiler. Now, a lot of companies have profilers, but this profile is used in the guide. So it actually goes around the surgical guide sleeve. And as it does that, it's creating a uniform reduction of bone so that there is no impingement of your healing abutments, custom abutment, stock abutment with bone. The x-ray here tells the story. Here you see a bunch of bone in the way. And then with the profile drill, you see it removed so there's no interference. And each profile drill has a different depth. And so you're not just guessing at what profile drill to use. It's, a, it's part of your menu according to the digital plan, which I think also gives me great comfort that I'm not winging it. And uh, I think you'll find uh, those of you using this that it's an amazing way to get an immediate abutment to see without impinging the bone. Those of you who have had that experience, you think you're tight, uh, you're not, the bone melts away a few days later, the abutment becomes loose. It just starts a bad sequela of things to come. So this is a very thoughtful uh, abutment profile part of the digital workflow of the DO system. Yeah, it's a good point. If any of you have ever done manual reduction of bone, you know how tedious that is. You end up over reducing over here, not enough over there, and you end up taking away more bone than you need, probably not even in the right spot. Um, so this is thoughtful. This is guided bone reduction, if you will, and um, really, really thoughtful. So that's the but abutment this is profiler. Done. This is done, though, before you put your implant in. Yes. This is so critical. See, a lot of times you put your implant in and realize, oh, my abutment doesn't fit now. Now you've got a problem. You've got a vulnerable uh, implant there that you don't want to scratch or touch or nick. And then that becomes a little bit more problematic. It, 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 it raises the, uh, the elevation of uh, stress and the outcome's not as clean as it could have been. Yeah, when you look at those x-rays, it almost looks like the implant goes in, they tried the abutment and, oh, we should use that profiler drill. Those x-rays are more for just teaching um, here. The implant would not even be in yet. And so you really don't appreciate the power of this drill because it does the magic before you even ran into the problem. But then other companies think they're so smart, they'll put a, an insertion tool into the implant that routes out the there and it just creates enormous heat. And maybe you've seen those. So, so Dio has again, a proprietary instrument that is thoughtful beyond uh, anything I've seen. So that's the abutment <clears throat> profiler. After that, it's a matter of putting the implant in. Um, this is called the implant connector. I think the only comment here is Dio has been very thoughtful and they've created a guide that allows for referencing of the timing or rotational um, aspect of the implant. So as you can see, the middle two pictures up in the top, there's the blue box that's flashing. There are three of those on the actual driver. You need to line up one of those three with that little wing that is being highlighted in red. And as those things line up on top of each other, the hex or the rotational timing of the implant matches the virtual plan 
Why is that important? Well, if you have a custom abutment that has a hex on it, that means that hex has to be in the appropriate alignment if everything's going to line up right. This is how you line it up right. So not only are you lining up this with this, but you're also lining up the proper depth, which can be uh, also outlined by a depth stop or other indicators. So it, this is a beautiful, thoughtful way to do it. I, uh, those of you who have gotten into rotational um, mismatch with, with eventual abutments, this, this is a nightmare, but they've solved it. Not only have they solved it, this sleeve, and many of you know this, but I'll just repeat it. This is a proprietary uh, sleeve. It is screwed into the guide and there is no cement. And for that, I'm very appreciative. I don't want any cement. I don't want any caustic material in my surgical site. And I want this to be absolutely deliberate and robust. In addition to that, the DO system had to build their own resins for accuracy and their own 3D printers. So they are in, an, in a game all by themselves. Nobody does it more accurate or more exact than the DO Navi system. And these are little things that allow this to happen. So that's the implant connector. Um, that's essentially, if you will, the workflow from A to Z. So we took each one of these and we talked about kind of some do's or don'ts. We talked about why they're important. The last thing I wanna highlight with this little worksheet is again, these little exits where you can jump off, if you will, the workflow based on the density and the, the workflow tells you what the density is. So we've done the math for you, if you will. And if it's a D3, you're going to stop there. If it's D1, D2, you're going to go ahead and we have a chart that will tell you that. Uh, makes it a little bit easier. Again, is it perfect? Is it the silver bullet that's going to make everything amazing in your implant world? No, but it makes it a heck of a lot more predictable. Um, the results are impressive. Again, this little recipe or this little protocol is very thoughtful. Thoughtfulness at every drill, at the design, at the speed, um, it's, it's been really, really cool. I'll show you a case now, um, just a simple little one. We're running a little bit short on time, but I'll go through just one little case and show you um, kind of how this looks. So this was an edentulous area, number 10. Um, put a guide on, you see- show, show the cutouts, or maybe you were just gonna put, point that out. Yeah, so the guide here has these little windows. There's one right here, there's another one over here, and another one back over here over the premolar. Those cutouts or windows help as a visual confirmation that the guide is seated properly. So you know the guide is matching the buckle contour, the proximal contour, the incisal edge. All of those things have to be flushed to know that the guide was seated properly. It's a whole nother topic, but really accurate diagnostics are key for something like this. But, but my point is very easy to see that it's seated. Yes. You know, it, and, and it's, it's just boom. You glance into those windows, you see a very tight space, boom, you're there. If yep. it doesn't rock, you're there. The reason uh, that sometimes they rock is our impressions aren't beautiful. And we can talk about that at another webinar. So from there, we're going to follow the protocol. Step one, tissue punch. Well, here's the tissue punch. Here's a different view. That's actually the soft tissue stuck inside right there. The guide was never removed. That double blade contact creates a suction that pulls the tissue up. Piece of cake, again, right now, just a helpful tip. Have your assistant come with the suction and hurry and suck it out right now. Otherwise, that's a bear to clean later and it drives the assistants nuts. So you're better to get that out right now. Sometimes I just take my surgical gloved hand and hold over these two vent holes, one here and one on the opposite side, and that creates the suction. They put the straw right on the end of it and then right up the straw it goes, and then you're off for the next uh, tissue punch. Yeah. Here's the bone flattener. Here it goes all the way to that black line, just creates a flat, um, a flat ramp that we can uh, drill on. Here is the key we talked about. So the tube goes in. This is a 12 millimeter tube, very, very long. This is a thin um, implant site. And so having a very long tube provides a lot of guidance for accuracy. One of the things I appreciate DO does is they've got two tubes at, the, at different lengths because you, know, you could run into this long tube, could hit the bone. So they've got a, a second length so that you're optimizing the length uh, to be as long as possible to ensure the accuracy and the lack of flex. For sure. Here, typically, at least mouth opening isn't a big deal because you're in the anterior, but sometimes those shorter tubes, shorter drills in the back does make your life a little easier. In the front, no reason not to use a long tube um, if you can. 
So here you see the drill loaded up. So the tube is in place, drill is loaded up. There is a depth stop. You will put the drill in and then you will push it, not running the pedal yet, until you find it resting on bone. Once it's resting on bone, then and only then do you push the pedal down. And by doing that, you will create less friction between the drill and the drill tube. Um, and then you push it all the way down to depth stop. The drill is then withdrawn and the irrigation syringe goes in all the way down to depth. You'll feel the bottom of the osteotomy. So the, the drill need or the irrigation needle is very long. So you can get all the way down um, to the base. The other day I was doing a bilateral sinus lift plus about six implants. I saved all the autogenous bone and I hardly needed to use any supplemental substrate. I was blown away at how much bone was harvested in four prior osteotomies. So you can use this slow speed drilling to also harvest your bone product to enhance your bone grafting uh, uh, circumstances that day. So here you see now going to the, um, the tubeless drills. So you here you see on the right, you see that it's all the way, uh, has the built-in tube, push it all the way to depth. And that's the double tube concept being epitomized. Exactly. For, for, for rigidity and for accuracy, hence exactness. And then here's that abutment profiler. It goes down to the bone, the top little cup up here it will rest on the very top of your surgical guide. And then the narrower shaft allows you to actually run around the perimeter of the surgical guide sleeve, allowing to create that bone profile so no abutments and pinch. This is really important today on this case because a custom abutment is getting ready to go in. And sometimes it is very ambiguous. Is it the tissue holding me up? Is it the bone holding me up? Am I holding me up because I just don't have the rotation right? If you can get the bone out of your way, the tissue out of your way, the next step is a lot easier. Now, some people mistake this as just a tissue profiler. This is not a tissue profiler. This is a bone profile. By running this, like Riley said on the inside here, the diameter of this bone cutter is outside the diameter of the implant. Hence, the emergence profile can be accomplished. Very thoughtful. Yeah, very, very thoughtful. This is the only other drill. So the, the bone flattening drill and the abutment profile drill might be the only two drills I ever consider going above 100 RPMs. Um, sometimes a little more speed on this one does make a difference. Not always, but if it's really, really dense cortical bone, anterior mandible, you might consider more speed. Again, you're going to augment with water if you do that. So that is that, the implant goes in nicely. We line up the rotation so that the hex is in line. Here I'm super zoomed in on the right here. You see a seating jig. It's basically a crown with a little wing on it. That wing helps me uh, match the contour of the adjacent tooth to seat the abutment. I seat the abutment and then I cement um, my temporary on top. And then that was it. This whole case, the shade uh, was decent. Uh, maybe not perfect. Those are hard to get sometimes, but um, this whole case was about a 12 minute surgery. And that is. And that's because Riley's particularly slow, if you think about it. You know, <laughs> he's been slow his whole life. And so it's I guess point. it surprised me it was 12 minutes. Yeah. But it, how long would have that taken you otherwise? You know, probably, you know, 25 minutes. Yeah, at least. Or an hour. Well, sometimes, I mean, you think about the freehand technique. If you're doing an implant freehand, you are then going to put an abutment in there, and then you're just going to make your temporary chair side. To make a good temporary chair side, I don't know about you guys, I've spent 25 minutes just on the temporary. Um, I've spent more than 25 minutes just on the temporary. So to have the whole case done start to finish in half that time, um, that's awesome in terms of the experience for the patient, the efficiency of the practice, um, everything about that. What I love about it is that particular crown um, is a PMMA temporary, it was printed, and there was zero adjustment done to the mesial or distal contact, and there was zero adjustment done to the marginal fit. Now, right. this is huge. It's possible, all of you doctors listen up, it's possible that this custom abutment is never gonna be taken out again. Therefore, the biologic mimic of the seal of biology is going to be optimized because we're not taking it in and out, in and out, in and out, causing long junctional epithelial and perpetuating peri-implantitis. I love this. Underneath of it is an optical target. You take that PMM off and you can 
you know, if you wanted to build another crown that you didn't like this, these contours, but that is huge. We'll talk about that at another webinar. I just wanted to whet your appetite, how, how uh, thoughtful and how biologically driven this system is. So that's a, just a little clinical case there. I guess in wrapping up, here's our last slide. Um, if you haven't written any questions down and you have some, um, now's the time to worry about that. I guess, um, it, you know, as I've thought about this, you know, I'm new to implantology. I've only been doing implants five years or so. I never thought you could dissect each drill and the methodology of drilling so thoughtfully. And so I guess the question I ask myself, and I want to pose it to all of us here is, you know, does this much detail really matter? And my answer is absolutely yes. And here's why. The details make all of the difference in practice. Sometimes we go to trade shows or sales reps walk in our door, who doesn't love that? And, uh, and you just, they think it's a kit. And we think a kit is a kit is a kit. Or we think, oh, I do guided surgery. Oh, this is a guide too. Guides are not all made equal. And I know that probably sounds obvious, but I didn't really appreciate that as much as I do now being really um, closely associated with different implant companies, different guide companies, and seeing the different methodologies. The details really do matter um, for all of the reasons listed here. End of the day, if we're going to embrace a workflow, we, we really want the end result to be optimal. And I haven't found anything that touches the end results. Implants are where they belong. Because of that, I can do immediate temps with extreme efficiency. Um, patients deserve, I think, the very best. And in our opinions, this is the very best. So why not give that to them? Um, any other thoughts? I agree. So thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that was helpful. I'm going to pull up some of the questions here. It looks like we have a lot of them. I'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, Flint, that is not a question. That is an observation. So Flint said, I can attest to the accuracy of this. He's, he's a DO user and does this all the time. What about Tim's, Riley? So Tim's asking, you know, what about minimal opening? I've seen this a few times for the two by 10 with the drill tube. So you're talking about minimal opening of the patient, the posterior probably. What's really nice with DO is they have that five millimeter pilot drill. That five millimeter pilot drill, very, very short. It allows you to get back in the mouth and try to get a little purchase. If you can't even get the five up over the guide on top in the sleeve, here's the trick. Out of the mouth, you take the drill tube and you slide it onto the two by five drill. So they're all connected. Now be careful, that could fall right off if you, you tilt it up. You're gonna take that and carefully put them both in the guide at the same time. By doing that, you save almost seven millimeters of vertical space and that will allow it to fit in. Now, you might have a patient that's a second molar, minimal opening. I will tell you that could be a limitation of guided surgery. Second molars, a tiny little mouth, limited opening. I mean, you're lucky if you can even get your high speed in a little carbide back there, let alone an implant. But drill. Tim, also, I would plan a seven millimeter implant in a posterior area and then freehand it uh, deeper later or, or, you know, after the guide's in there. Use the guide as an LAD guide or an L location angulation guide and then do it. It's just, there's, there's nothing going to get around uh, disassembling the jaw of the patient and trying to get access to these things. It's just, it's just a tough thing. But I think there are a little bit of advantages with some of this, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say that's the ultimate advantage. It's, it's all the exactness that, that impresses me the most. And you're right, Brian, PK does stand for party king. That's right. So, okay, Flint, good job. So his question is, why would you ever do it any other way? You just, don't, you don't know what yeah. you don't know. And you are so busy doing what you're doing. You just don't get off the pace. And now we're all forced to get off the pace. It's a great time to look at different options out there. It's been a privilege for us to share this with you. Uh, we're, we're big believers. Uh, we're learning and growing daily with it. Uh, our, our, our patients are the benefactors of it. If you have any questions regarding wanting to do a test drive with us, uh, we'll build you a guide and get to your office and help you out when the, when the time's right. Yeah, those are our emails right there, personal emails. We check them ourselves. So feel free to shoot an email. An email will also go out inviting all of you if you want to schedule a 30-minute kind of powwow with either PK or I, we can sit down and just talk about your implant practice. Now's a great time. We, uh, I assume a lot of you are not seeing patients all day, every day. 
And because of that, um, let's, let's take this opportunity to get together and just talk and dialogue how, um, how we can improve our skill set. End of the day, it's all about the patient. We want to give the patient the very best. We want to constantly strive to improve our craft. And I think this hour has been worthwhile, but if we can be helpful in the future to improve that, just reach out and let us know. Otherwise, we really appreciate everyone's attention. Hope that you guys um, stay really safe. Hope you're doing well. If we can do anything to help, um, reach out, but we thank you for your attendance. What's next week? I don't think we have a title for next week, but we're probably gonna do one next Monday as well. I think some details are probably coming. So look okay. for some more details on that and we'll, uh, we'll uh, put something together, another song and dance for you. My last parting advice is be the dentist your mother thinks you are. All right, get out of here.